Good morning and welcome to the Core Connection. I'm Mira Rubin here with you on Enlightened World Network. And today's topic is loving the future. And um, we, we typically think these days of a future filled with gloom and doom and it inspires fear and despair. And what if we were to instead put our attentions toward having the courage to envision a future that we love and that we can love into being? So that should be an in, hopefully an inspiring and insightful conversation that we can share. And uh, good morning, good morning, Rosalyn. Welcome. It's great to have you here with us this morning. And welcome to everyone else who's joining us. Uh, before we get started, let's take a minute or two to get present. So let's take a deep breath in through your nose and hold it. And imagine clean, crisp oxygen flooding your lungs, flowing into your bloodstream, nourishing all your cells, all your organs, and bringing vital life energy to your body and being. And as you exhale, exhale any tension, stress, negativity, fatigue. And now let's take another deep breath in through your nose and hold it. This time, imagine brilliant bright light lighting you up from the inside out illuminating electrifying and energizing all your cells your molecules your electrons creating a brilliant beam of light from your heart out into the world and as you exhale exhale any remaining tension stress negativity fatigue and now let's press our palms together Vigorously rub your palms together, feel the friction, the temperature, the pressure, the motion, the tickling and tingling when you stop and allow all those sensations to bring you present right here, right now into this remarkable physical form that enables you to experience life. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And it's great to be here with you today and to be talking about having the courage to imagine a bright future, um, to be holding space for the possibility that we can shift the trajectory that we're currently on, that we can have a monumental miraculous shift of awareness culturally, globally, and, and create a world that not only are we not afraid to live in, but that we love. And um, this, this topic comes about as a result of the book that I had mentioned to you, uh, written by Nina Simons. I'm excited to be having the opportunity to interview her for um, the Sustainability Now podcast. This is her book, and it's quite beautiful, quite, quite beautiful. And I have to say that I share so much of the sensibility that she expresses, so many of the perspectives. It's Nature, Culture, and the Sacred, A Woman Listens for Leadership. And um, she, she was, I believe it was actually a quote talking about loving the future. Um, but what, what gives me hope for humanity and, and our possibility of being able to transform the state of things. Uh, there's a couple things that give me hope for this without it being an entirely um, ungrounded 
the sort of hope. If we look at the pandemic, what we saw was that in a very, very, very brief period of time, the whole world globally galvanized around one particular threat, we can say, the COVID threat, that the whole world stopped and I believe that that's probably unprecedented. Good morning, good morning, good evening, Gia. Welcome, great to have you here with us this morning. Uh, we're talking about loving the future. And really, you know, in, in considering this notion of loving the future, I noticed that there was some fear on my part to, to have that hope. I think it takes courage not to be in denial and yet to be able to hold that kind of hope. And as I said, the, the whole pandemic, the occurrence of the pandemic gave me hope to recognize that something global can occur. First of all, like a global shift can occur and it can occur in a short period of time. So that gave me tremendous hope or gives me hope to know that we can, we can find unity. Hopefully, you know, the idea is to have unity over creating a correction um, rather than, than shutting everything down, you know, maybe just like creating a global shift of awareness. Um, so, also, another thing that is particularly hopeful is that so much of the destruction that we've wrought has been wrought in the space of pretty much 50 years, like the super degradation. Um, it's gone on longer than that, but in the space of a relatively short period of time. And then if we want to also look at other radical changes that have occurred in such a short period of time, we can look at the advent of the internet and how that has really transformed the way that we think, the way that we interact with each other, with business, with um with the planet, with awareness. So this is another thing that has been a pretty short-term kind of transformation that's global and radical. And um, the another thing that gives me hope for being willing to imagine or, or daring to imagine a future that I love um, is things like um, what we're learning from the organization Water Stories, which is that in a very short period of time, it's possible to transform landscapes, to actually shift climates, we know that planting trees or the trees growing forests transform climates. We know that we can um, capture water and allow it to replenish. We, we can assist nature in replenishing the aquifers. And as we do that, it, it replenishes or helps to replenish the soil, which then uh, grows things that also are transforming climate and that we can actually see um, localized climate changes in the space of one season even in certain circumstances or several seasons in others. And that in the space of 10 years, we can make massive, massive transformations in helping nature to be revitalized. So, so seeing these things, all of these things are hopeful. And to me, 
um, in, in giving me a little bit of courage to dream the, the future that we love into being. And the question is, what does that look like? What does that look like, the, a future that we love? And um, what I notice in asking that question is that it challenges the imagination on a very deep level. Um, because what we know is what is going to be coloring what we imagine to be possible. So our tendency in trying to contend with this kind of question is to use our rational minds to extrapolate on things as they are. And while people were predicting a pandemic, I don't know that people would have necessarily predicted how quickly we could globally shut down the world, the human world. And also the uh, resurgence of nature that occurred during that time, which is another hopeful aspect, right? That we saw that that nature is very resilient. And while we may be on a trajectory that has potential for our demise, um, the planet and life itself is going to outlive us. There's no doubt about that. And will survive beyond us. So this notion of courage um, to dream a future into being that we, in our heart of hearts, we can find a place where we do know it's possible. And what, what does it look like? What does it look like? What does it um, feel like to hold the space for that future? a future where we're working in harmony with nature, where we recognize that we are part of nature, a future where we have respect for each other, where we nourish the higher aspects of ourselves and, and express those in the way we conduct commerce and um, governance where what what would this future be for you you know what as you maybe allow yourself a moment's grace to consider what a future that we love would be loving the future and a future that we love. When we give ourselves the latitude to indulge in that imagining, we're going to call it imaginal space rather than imagination, um, because imaginal space is kind of connecting with our other than conscious intelligence it's connecting with the greater field of consciousness and awareness to be able to access um, information solutions um, potentials that we might not otherwise have considered i think there are so many of us that have been and myself too I have been have been caught in a belief of in the inevitability of 
the destruction that we're um, that we're seeing, the inevitability of its acceleration. And what if it's not inevitable? What if we get to dream a new future into being? And by taking action, of course, but by holding the frequency of those new potentials, by holding the frequency of that possibility, we're creating a field in which it can emerge. That's how we create things, right? We create things by first creating the concepts, first generating the vision, and then action becomes inspired and we can take action. And there are so many people on the planet right now that are taking action and creating new possibilities and that are that are generating inspired action to support the new a, a way of being that will create a future that we love. This whole conversation about the courage to dream. Uh, I love this. So Rosalind says health would be accessible, like ordering a pizza. I love that idea. What? But then we get to define what is health. Because I think we get to the. Um, right now, in a way. We labor under the notion that health is accessible by taking this pill or that pill or this supplement or that supplement. And so um, is that health or is there a way that we can access and harness health within too? Interesting thoughts, you know, like what would, what else would be in this future. I love that though, Rosalind, because health obviously is fundamental. So, um, and one of the other things that I didn't mention that's also really hopeful is this growing regenerative movement, um, regenerative agriculture and regenerative, I, I haven't heard a lot about regenerative medicine, but perhaps I'm hoping that that's on the horizon you know, one of the things that is very much regenerative medicine is stem cell uh, technology. And it was something we were hearing about for a while there, and it is miraculous. And then all of a sudden, it just seemed to fall off the radar. Um, the pharmaceutical companies were fighting it horribly, and uh, the FDA, and so there are there are huge potentials for uh, regenerative health um, and a lot of our systems need to change you know we see we see stuff with the um oh i don't want to go down that that rabbit hole right now anyway um so health would be accessible and Maybe it would be more energetic medicine, right? Because ultimately we are frequency, we are energy. And if we can be interacting more on that level, then um, the pharmaceutical kind of palliative approach, um, that could be an amazing thing. I, I see us being able to be much more connected to our food supply. I know a lot of the futuristic thing is is uh, food grown in a test tube, you know, where they're literally right now already creating uh, laboratory meat. So we don't wouldn't have to be raising animals for slaughter. We would be growing them in in laboratories instead, not growing the animal, but growing the meat. And um, that seems kind of 
wrong-headed to me, I have to say, but you know, it's one person's opinion. Um, I don't know that that's, I, I think that we lose sight of the fact that uh, food grown in the soil has a different vitality and nutritive value um, than food grown, for instance, aquaponically or aeroponically. Air, I, I think that's the right word, um, aeroponically, maybe. Anyway, um, that the soil, there's so much more going on in the soil than just dirt, than just a growing medium. There's all kinds of life and energy and communication between different. So hydroponic, thank you. Um, hydroponic and aquaponic. Thank you, Roslyn. <laughs> Mind blip. But anyway, um, those, those ways of growing food are helpful where, where we haven't been, where we don't have access to the land. Um, but maybe we get to cultivate greater land access. Who knows? I mean, there's so many things to be looking at. Um, the way that we live, our buildings, the buildings that we build could be very much more in harmony with nature. The, the educational systems that we have could be very much more aligned with uh, being learning learning life skills, you know, rather than um, rather than well, this goes into it's it's very interesting. I was going to say rather than learning history, but the thing about history, we were talking about this the other day about how history changes depending on who's who's empowered, right? The um, history is the story of the victors, so to speak. And um, we now see history changing as we're uh, giving greater recognition to people who are not um, the old white men that kind of wrote history that we live with in this country. So, you know, there's there's a lot of change happening with that. So maybe our stories are more inclusionary. Um, one of the things that Nina wrote about in her book is um, she she learned from an indigenous elder that the way that they can learn, the way that they learn about a society is by learning about their creation stories and <clears throat> the um, indigenous people's creation stories incorporate humans and animals and elements and this this interconnectedness and our creation story or the the judeo-christian creation story is one of exile and separation and punishment. And it's very, very dramatic contrast. And so maybe we get to recreate our stories. That, that was such a profound um, recognition for me. Like hearing that, it was just, oh my gosh, look at this. Look at this. This is the source of so much of what we see now rampant in the world, the, um, the domination and control, the, the combativeness, the, um, the enmity, the punishment and suffering and, and um, the lack of harmony. It's so fascinating, right? It never occurred to me. I never made that connection. And it's such a brilliant connection. So anyway, let's look at what, what would be this beautiful future that we could love. And also let's notice what arises as we start entertaining that thought, like the fear that shows up 
the fear of of being disappointed or of um it it takes courage it takes courage to step into possibility when you know that there's the possibility that that won't come true you know and it's interesting some people always people say um prepare for the worst and hope for the best but you can't do both you can't do both and what if we generate the courage to hold the space for a, a future we love it's a really interesting question to be engaging in and uh, i invite you to join me with it in it that together we can do that we can create the field for that and what we put our attention on multiplies so as we look at the potentials as we look at the things that are hopeful as we give those things energy there may be a chance that we actually can create that shift. So in that, that's it for today. I'm Mira Rubin, this is The Core Connection, and I go live here each weekday morning on the Enlightened World Network Facebook page and YouTube channel. And I invite you to check out the other awesome programming on Enlightened World Network and Enlightened World Living. and I am so grateful to you for the opportunity to share um, these thoughts and expansions and inquiries together. So until next time, so much love to you.